Vaigurudji Ka Khalsa, Vaigurudji Ki Fadeh. Welcome to another Sikh Spectrum. And today I've come to Nottingham to interview Dr. Jaswant Singh Bilku, who is a retired GP and also will be coming uh, or appointed as the High Sheriff of Nottingham. And we'll talk about their, their life and how they've come to this particular position, um, how they were nominated, um, and understand generally what issues they had when they grew up in the UK. So, Dr. Sir, Vaigur Ji Ka Khalsa. Vaigur Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaigur Ji Ki Fateh. Let's start by asking you a question um, that uh, give us a short profile about, uh, about when you first came to the UK. Okay, well, I came to the UK with my mother and um, there were four of us, four children and my mother. And we followed my father who'd come pre five years previously. If I remember rightly, when he first came in 1955, he said he, he'd borrowed some money from some of his friends to come here to earn enough money to go back and educate his children. That was really his ambition. And if I remember rightly, I think he came to make 20,000 rupees and then go back. But what then happened was once he'd made enough money to be able to go back if he wanted to, he actually discovered that his ambition of educating children could be realized much better in Nottingham because the education here was free and by this time he'd bought a house, he had a steady job. So the idea was that he'd bring the children over, educate them and then we'll all go back. And I'm the eldest of six now because two of my younger siblings were born in Nottingham after we arrived. And um, I, being the eldest, when I graduated, the idea was that we'd all go back to India. And with that in mind, he'd built a little koti in Chandigarh. And in fact, after I graduated, I took six months off um, work and went to Chandigarh for three months to have a look around and have a look at India and to see how things, if I could settle there. And I could have settled there, I love India, but by this time there are five siblings who are at various stages of education themselves and so their education had to be taken care of. So basically, I think like all immigrant families, Nobody, I believe, comes here to settle. We come to better ourselves and we all want to go back to mother country. But I think circumstances then change and you get embedded in the society that you grow up in. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've ended up here. But you, you came over when you were about 13. So do you have yes. memories of India? Oh, yes. I have very fond memories of India. I grew up in a very happy household uh, in a village in Punjab uh, near Jalandhar. It's called Kang Sabu. And uh, I went to school from Kang Sabu to Lambra, which is a couple of miles away. Uh, and I remember cycling there and back every day, um, playing in the fields, going to the local Gurdwara and, and so on. Yes, I have... Uh, quite good memory of uh, what India was like because by and large they were very pleasant memories. I miss my father of course because he'd left when uh, I was eight. Right. So what education did you do in India before you left? I, uh, I passed the eighth class. Right. And then I came here. So you came in here and went straight to secondary school then I assume? Yes. I went straight to secondary school <coughs> And actually, it's quite interesting, it, it was then uh, called the worst school in Nottingham, in fact. <laughs> okay. um, but that was the catchment area we lived in. Um, and I went to school there, and uh, one of my earliest memories is a maths test that um, they it, did. And the maths test was, it, uh, I think it was, we had to do six questions out of ten and we had about an hour and a half to do it in. And as you probably know, it, if you come from India, your knowledge of maths and times tables is so good that I managed to finish those questions in about half an hour. 
And I didn't do six out of ten, I did ten out of ten, and I took them to the teacher. And he grabbed my arm and took me to the head, headmaster and he said, I think he's in the wrong school. <laughs> so actually then an arrangement was made for me to transfer to another school where I did my O-levels. Right. And I got five O-levels. My English was very poor uh, in those days, but uh, thanks to one man in particular, Jack Aram, who was the headmaster of Claremont School that I went to, he perhaps saw the potential or was just kind and showed me the way in which I could uh, actually um, realize my aspiration, which was to become a doctor. So you've always wanted to become a doctor then? Well, actually, uh, you could say the family always wanted me to <laughs> become a doctor. Right. Uh, so once we decided as a family that I was going to be the doctor and my brother was going to be the solicitor, <laughs> as you might imagine, we both set ourselves that mission. Right. And so all through my schooling, despite some actually quite uh, a few obstacles, um, I, I was pretty single-minded that that's where I wanted to go. And... Uh, I remember my zoology teacher because I wasn't very good at writing, uh, you know, prose and essays in zoology. And he would always throw the essays almost back at me and say, Bilku, do you want to do medicine with this? And I would simply say, yes, sir. The reason I tell you that story is because when I was a houseman at the city hospital in Nottingham, the zoology master was actually admitted under my care with a coronary thrombosis. <laughs> so it was actually quite a, a nice meeting, right. you know, so it was a bit surreal. But um, yes, I, uh, the family wanted me to okay. study medicine. In the early days, did you have any issues living here as a, uh, um, you know, an Indian? Yes, I think we all did in the 60s. Um, I mean, Discrimination was, uh, you know, pretty open really because I remember once uh, uh, at university, for example, uh, I phoned up and for some accommodation and when myself and my friend John, we arrived to look at this particular flat, the lady at the other end said, oh, it's, it's already been promised to a medical student. And I said, well, I am the medical student <laughs> that you <laughs> promised it to on the phone. But you could tell that she wasn't terribly keen to have me as, as her lodger. Right, right. So I, th I think there were issues like that, but not, not serious issues. No. I, I've been very lucky in my career that uh, actually, apart from the odd incident like that, uh, they, they, it's been a fairly, um, you know, smooth ride, if you like, and, I, I, and I've been very fortunate. Okay, so moving on, um, how about giving us something about your family then? When did you get married? Um, we got married in 1976, um, and my wife is a dental surgeon from Coventry, and it was... Uh, the best decision I've made in my life. Um, she's been a fantastic support uh, in supporting me in my career and the two children that we have. Uh, that, and she has spent all her, she's dedicated her life really to me, uh, my development and the children's development. Um, and your two children, what do they do? Yeah, well, Anil is uh, the eldest, he's 34 and he's uh, a GP and he's in a large practice just outside Nottingham, north of Nottingham. And uh, Kiran, who's two years younger, our lovely daughter who recently got married, um, she's also a GP and uh, she worked in Nottingham. She graduated in Birmingham and then worked in Nottingham uh, for a while and now she's got married, she's moved down to Surrey. So everyone's a GP in your family? Well, 
you could say, uh, I was a GP for 27 years. Both my children are general practitioners. And um, my wife is a dental surgeon. But both my wife and I are now retired. Right. Yeah. I mean, I want to ask you a question. You're also an education manager. Um, yes. Is that, uh, what do education managers do? Okay. Well, what happened all through my GP career, I was interested in education and training. So virtually from day one when I was uh, a GP, um, a local trainer, if you like, of GPs at the time, and they were called course organizers, started sending me trainees. And um, so I got involved in teaching and training. So, and the first time you could actually officially be appointed as a trainer is after you've been in practice for three years. So at three years, I was appointed a trainer and uh, uh, had trainees in the practice. And then I managed um, the Nottingham Vocational Training Scheme, where we trained GPs around the county. From there on, I then moved to the university um, and became an associate advisor and then eventually a GP dean and then finally postgraduate dean. Um, and the postgraduate dean role is to oversee, if you like, manage the education of all postgraduate doctors uh, once they've qualified and other allied health professionals as well. Right. So that was my role at the university before okay. I finally so, retired. Right. What about in the early days, you, in, in the 60s, there was a, you, start, you were the first president for the Indian Youth Club. Oh, what did right. that involve? Well, that takes me back a little bit. Um, there was uh, uh, an association that uh, some of our elders, a few that were here at the time that had formed that was uh, called the Indian Association. And they were very supportive. They wanted to develop the youth at the time. And uh, I was asked to form a youth club. So we had actually 40 Indian children, mainly Punjabis uh, in those days. And we ran the youth club and it was uh, playing uh, games, uh, sport. Uh, we used to play music, uh, harmonium, tabla, that sort of thing. And then we did some community work. Right. Talking about um, youth activities, when I've walked in here, I see that you have some vajje, some tavle in the house. Do you, do you play the harmonium? Or? I dabble. I, I, I play the harmonium a little and because I'm very interested in uh, singing. So I sing and play the harmonium, but only socially. Right. Um, so so you, do, you don't go to the Gurdwara and sing I, shabads? I have done a few shabads, but not on a regular basis. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, let me talk about some of the um, some of the charity organisations that um, that you were active members or you were an active member of. One of those was the the Lionheart Project. Yeah. What was the reason behind working with that particular organisation? Okay. Well, basically, the uh, I belong to. I am a charter member of the Nottingham West Lions Club in in Nottingham, and uh, we uh, part of what we do is obviously raise funds to support uh, you know, people around the world in third world countries and, uh, and so on. But there are some local initiatives and one of the things that we felt we wanted to do was to actually raise awareness of coronary artery disease, looking after your heart if you like. And um, so this particular Lions Club has a lot of Sikh and Indian members. And we called our project Mera Dil Meri Jaan, okay. which is, and in English we call it the Project Lionheart. Right. And that's what that was about. And basically what we've done is uh, we prepared leaflets in uh, various uh, Indian languages which we've distributed in gurdwaras and mosques and temples. And uh, basically it talks about, you know, not smoking, alcohol, uh, looking after your heart by exercising, watching your diet, and, and so on. 
I want to talk about the because you've, you've had numerous awards that you've got, but there's a few of them I want to touch on. And there was one in 2005, which yep. is known as the Glory of India Award. Yes. Um, you have to explain to me what this Glory of India Award is. Well, basically, uh, this came as a bit of a surprise to me, but uh, uh, there was a letter that said that you've been recommended to receive this award uh, for your work in making Mother India proud by uh, doing some cross-cultural work and your achievements, if you like, in the UK. And in the same letter they said one of the other recipients of this award was Mother Teresa. Right. Uh, so yes, I, I, it was uh, nice to be recognised and uh, received that uh, award and uh, it was, uh, we had to, we went to London and there was a, a ceremony at which that award uh, was given. Right. So do you also, um, one of the things that, that I was reading was that you were the first director or course director for the diploma in prison. Um, oh, prison medicine. Yes, yes. prison medicine. What was the, what, what, how did that start about? From uh, early 80s, uh, you had to actually go through a vocational training scheme which is three years, and it's now compulsory to do that postgraduate training before you can become a GP. But you could still, while you had to get that postgraduate uh, qualification in general practice to become a GP, you could still work in prison medicine, prisons, uh, and provide GP type services with a much lower qualification. And our aim was to actually raise those standards in prison so that prisoners, they're citizens, and they actually deserve the same quality of GP as the rest uh, outside. So the very first thing we did, and it, uh, the Nottingham Deanery, where I was postgraduate dean, was the first deanery that set up this postgraduate diploma that we offered to the prison medical officers. So we actually raised the standard of um, the care provided in prisons. And as it happened, it was the world first. And we had uh, inquiries from Canada, from Hong Kong and places oh, okay. to see, uh, look at our curriculum. And so, yes, I mean, I was quite proud to be associated with that. Okay, I mean, another thing that you also did was you, 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 take, you play a lead role in the quality assurance of medical education. Yeah. And you've led certain visits and so on. What is, do you still do that even now? Uh, not now I, since I retired, but as a postgraduate dean, we used to, and I was one of the lead visitors, there'll be a team of visitors. It's like, a bit like Ofsted, right. if you like, for schools. But we would go and visit uh, organizations that provided postgraduate education for doctors and look at their standards and make sure that the standards are robust and up to date. And I have to say, not only were you uh, making sure that their standards were up to date, uh, one of the joys was that you learned from uh, your visits as to how you could improve standards in, in your own uh, deanery. Right. So yes, that, that was an interesting role and we, we travelled to Northern Ireland, Scotland and all the other uh, parts of the United Kingdom really. It, it was quite a privilege. Okay. I want to talk about your nomination as the, uh, as the High Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah. And when I first heard about sheriffs, you'll have to explain you know, my naivety on this question. I, kept, I thought about um, you know, Robin Hood days as the sheriff or the high sheriff. I don't sheriff. blame you. And it's a very sort of American term. Yes. I, you know, having come from London, it's not even a term that I've even heard much about. So okay. could you explain exactly what it means that you've been nominated and yep. what is all this high sheriff in the UK? Does it still exist? Okay. Well, first of all, to, um, if you deal with the myth of the sheriff of Nottingham, um, I think uh, there are a few cities in uh, the UK that uh, have the sheriff and Nottingham obviously retains that because of the uh, association with Robin Hood it's famous for. <clears throat> and, but that's really a, uh, if I might call it a political appointment and the sheriff of Nottingham I believe is usually a councillor. And 
they promote business and uh, they do a lot of other community work as well. The high sheriff role exists in every county and there are 55 high sheriffs around the UK, UK okay. in England and Wales. Right. Yeah. Uh, and actually, because of the uh, British Raj, I believe there are three, three high sheriffs in India still, in oh, okay. the, the large cities. Calcutta, I believe, is one of them. Right. Yeah. So, so that's an appointment um, by the Queen. Um, and, I mean, to be honest, I have no idea how my nomination went forward initially, because I think the High Sheriff um, is identified, if you like, within the county as someone who's appropriate for the role. And then there is a committee that then vets, if you like, locally, whether the name of that person ought to go forward. I've learned this since my nomination. And the incumbent High Sheriff then nominates the person that the committee, if you like, approves. It goes to the Privy Council in London and they then do the various searches because there is a matter of security and, and the dignity of the role and so on. So they do some research and there's an installation ceremony uh, for the High Sheriff's role uh, which in my case will be on the 11th of April this year. And where is that taking place? That's taking place at uh, Gurdwara in Nottingham. In it, isn't that unusual? It is very unusual because uh, uh, to, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a High Sheriff um, sworn in in a Gurdwara previously. Um, the one, the ceremonies I've attended, uh, attended of my predecessors have always happened in churches. So they've gone to their local church and uh, did the swearing in ceremony. But being of a Sikh extraction and being a very proud Sikh uh, myself, because I love my culture and I, uh, I would like it to happen in front of the Guru Granth Sahib. Um, and uh, it's going to take place in a Gurdwara. Okay, well, I think we're, we're coming nearly to the end of our interview. We will come and record that event, so that'll be quite nice on that day. I'll make sure that we send cameras down once we get permission from the Gurdwara to record it. Yes. Um, because we would like to record that ceremony ourselves. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that would be really good for the Sikh community because one thing that I feel is this role is not really for me. I want to dedicate this role really to my parents in particular who have uh, worked day and night to get us where we are, to my wife who's been great support and to the wider community and family who actually it's they that deserve the honour if you like and I think it's fitting that it's going to happen within our community um, because everybody will be able to see it and, uh, uh, and feel part of it. Okay, so now that we've come virtually to the end of our interview, what date is that, um, that service that's going to take place? That's going to take place on the 11th of April. It's a Saturday morning. Okay. And... Uh, the format is going to be, there will be Shabads, there will be Ardas, and then uh, there will be a Langar. But within that um, normal format for a Sikh ceremony, if you like, there will be the um, swearing-in ceremony and, and a few speeches uh, and so on. No, that's great. I think we, we at the Sikh channel will look forward to recording that. So is there any last um, words you'd like to say to our viewers? Well, I think it's a, a, it's a privilege to be appointed a high sheriff. And I, I would say that this country actually provides us with huge opportunities. And I always think uh, 
of um, you know keeping the the six uh, ethics in mind and that is um, that you know we are saint soldiers we look after our insides if you like our uh, uh, mental well-being by being saintly and jepping the nam if you like but the soldier bit is that if we want to go and get something we can because the opportunities are there and Guru Gobind Singh actually showed us the way and I always like to uh, keep that in mind that despite the obstacles we can actually achieve uh, whatever we want to achieve and I think our Sikhs in this country have, have done a tremendous amount of work and uh, they've, they've achieved enormous, enormous amount and I think um, I ho hope that I can act as a role model to some of our youngsters. Yeah. No, that's great. So we've come to the end of our interview and I hope that um, it's given some insight to um, Dr. G's life and especially the idea about them becoming the high sheriff and I hope that in the future other Sikhs can you know, take this position or whatever, however they're nominated that they will come forward as well. So I want to thank you Dr. G for allowing us to come to your house um, and uh, allowing us to interview you here. So thank you very much, Fateh Blali. Bye, Guruji. 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 Bye,